And now I'd like to introduce Sarah Danforth. Um, Sarah is the Harm Reduction Services Coordinator for Prevention Point Pittsburgh. She's worked in harm reduction and homeless outreach for over 10 years, including as a peer support specialist with the PATH team in Western North Carolina. She's pursuing a master's degree in public health through the Bloomberg America Health Initiative Fellowship at Johns Hopkins University. All right, Sarah, if you're ready, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Jessica. All right, let's get this started. Okay, so I'm Sarah Danforth. I work with Prevention Point Pittsburgh, <coughs> and we are, <coughs> excuse me, we are Pittsburgh's Needle Exchange Program and Harm Reduction Center. So I'm going to talk to you today about some aspects of harm reduction and how they apply to the peer programs here at CPP. Uh, it's great to know that so many of you are already familiar with harm reduction. So harm reduction, this is usually the uh, standard uh, definition for harm reduction. It's a practical set of strategies that aim to reduce the negative health, social, and economic consequences that occur with higher risk behaviors. It is also a movement for social justice built on a belief in and respect for the rights of people who use drugs. So harm reduction, as we often know it, generally focuses around reducing the risk in drug use. It can also be uh, more broad, broadly and sort of societally accepted. We can talk about uh, the use of seat belts and bike helmets as forms of harm reduction or designated drivers. Uh, for alcohol drinking and as a as a form of harm reduction, but uh, today we're really looking at sort of beyond that. Uh, let's see, is my screen working? There we go. Uh, to sort of look at the you know the the radical love philosophy of harm reduction, which is really about uh, trying to address the the stigma and shame around drug use. And so not just talking about harm reduction, this is a great quote from Monique Tula, the executive director of the Harm Reduction Coalition. Uh, not just talking about harm reduction as the idea of meeting people where they are at, although as she says in this quote, harm reduction, it's meeting people where they are at, but not leaving them there. But looking at uh, uh, the second statement, this is part of what I use as a guiding light in building a peer program within our needle exchange. So this is a movement, and it's one that's shifting resources and power to the people who are most vulnerable to structural violence, and that, that would be the people who use drugs. So to get back, though, to what we most know of as harm reduction, this, this uh, phrase, meeting people where they are at, but not leaving them there. Let's talk about this practically. If you're using harm reduction in your organization, how are you um, using harm reduction ideals physically? Are you meeting people where they're at? Are you going out to find them? Are you providing ways to make it easy and accessible to get to your office? Uh, do they have to buzz in and submit their name to get into your office, or are they allowed to enter safely anonymously? Emotionally, who is leading the conversation when you are meeting someone where they are at? What information and assistance are you offering? And does it accurately reflect what someone is saying? Is this language value neutral and realistic? For example, within a needle exchange program, uh, while we certainly wish for everyone to use a sterile syringe for every time we inject, uh, we make sure to keep our language value neutral when asking people about their injection practices. So just sort of acknowledging whether they're able to use a sterile syringe or not and not uh, letting them know that they're bad if they share syringes with a partner. Practically, looking at harm reduction, what are you realistically able to offer? And what do you actually know about? 
Uh, I say don't fake it because, um, you know, sometimes people get a little swept up in the world of uh, interacting with people who use drugs and pretend to know more than they do. And uh, from my years of working with people who use drugs, um, they don't need you to be an expert on the drug that you that they're using. They just need you to be uh, authentic and in your own in your own experience. So I also say that um, if you haven't been paying attention for the last three slides, you can just focus on this slide and you'll be embodying the spirit of harm reduction. Uh, I am not the expert of another person's experience. This is a great meme, something of a mantra for me. It's a great thing to remember in all aspects of our life, but especially when we are working with uh, people who use substances. So to talk a little bit more about our organization and the, as the more tangible aspects of harm reduction, syringe service exchange, syringe service programs, also known as needle exchanges, are becoming one of the fastest growing examples of an evidence-based CDC recommended approach for adequately addressing the needs of the opioid crisis. Here is an infographic from the CDC that illustrates the multitude of services that exist under the term needle exchange. So it's sterile injection supplies, it's also HIV and hep C testing, case management. And for Prevention Point Pittsburgh, it includes all of these services. So sterile injection equipment, that means as many needles as someone needs, uh, along with all of the equipment to um, use drugs safely. We do testing for HIV, Hep C, and uh, sexually transmitted infections. We do a lot of education around uh, disease prevention and safer injection. We offer case management services, so that means uh, we support someone wherever they are with their use, their use being chaotic managed or looking to uh, find treatment or detox options to um, step into recovery. So we offer all of those services within our needle exchange program. We offer the referrals to them. We offer uh, free safe injection training and wound care consult consultation with a nurse or a doctor. We have that weekly. We do crisis intervention and counseling. We offer condoms. We offer overdose prevention and response training. Uh, so we offer naloxone or Narcan, and we also offer all the training um, as to how to use it. And we offer fentanyl test strips. We offer all of these services for free, and they are anonymous and confidential. <clears throat> all right, and so these are just some numbers to get a sense of our scope. So almost half a million syringes, well, technically almost 420,000 syringes, through 3,500 encounters across all of our sites. That was in 2017. And this is, you know, for um, one county in uh, Pennsylvania. 252 people participated for the first time in, in our syringe services in 2017. 2017, we wrote uh, 700 or 676 new naloxone prescriptions, and we had uh, around 1,200 naloxone refills provided. So um, that means that we had almost 2,000 kits. There's two doses in every kit of naloxone that were distributed in our community. And so the, um, to put that in a little more perspective, in 2017, um, amongst the naloxone that we distributed, we had 720 overdose reversals that were reported back to us. So that is people who use drugs saving the lives of other people who use drugs. What that means is that for every three kits that we distributed, a life was saved. Here is a map of Allegheny County. So that is uh, Pittsburgh that you're looking at there. And this is a map that shows the hot spots for overdose death. So um, the redder the color, the uh, more overdose deaths that were occurring in that area. For 2017, 
Allegheny County had 735 overdose deaths. And if you remember the number from the last slide, uh, Prevention Point Pittsburgh had 720 reported successful overdose reversals, as in the person didn't die, from people who use our needle exchange programs. So 720 reported successful overdose reversals, 735 overdose deaths. Um, we can imagine that if Prevention Point wasn't around to distribute naloxone to people who use drugs, the people most likely to be at the scene of an overdose, that that 735 uh, overdose deaths number could be potentially doubled. So we are very grateful for the people who are out there uh, saving the lives of those around them. And here, just uh, overlaid on the uh, this heat overdose map is PPPs needle exchange locations. There is a lot to say about the policy issues around needle exchange legality in Pennsylvania. That is not what this presentation is about. To summarize, needle exchanges are illegal in Pennsylvania, except in Allegheny and Philadelphia counties. Prevention Point Pittsburgh has to get extensive neighborhood support and permission from the Board of Health and City Council before being allowed to set up a needle exchange location. And at each of our locations, we are only open for two to three hours a week. So we're doing great work. We're distributing you know, 420,000 needles um, a year by being open only seven hours a week. So we're doing the best work we can under strict legislation. Realistically, we're not doing enough. Not that we don't want to be, but because we aren't allowed to be doing more. And up until about two months ago, we weren't able to get a needle exchange in the reddest area of the overdose heat map. There is a lot of fear and misunderstanding that prevents programs like ours from offering life-saving services to the people who most need it. All right, and uh, here are some photos of the friendly staff at the Needle Exchange. And yes, that is me with my three-week-old baby wearing magic t-shirts on the left. And uh, do we want to pause here for questions? Um, absolutely. Um, the question that I've seen come in is the following. Uh, it's a question about fentanyl test strips. Um, so people want, uh, the question is, uh, do you know about any statistics about the effectiveness of giving fentanyl test strips to um, people who are using drugs to prevent overdose? Um, or what about giving them to street level dealers who are a little bit higher up the supply chain? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there, there has been some data actually out of Johns Hopkins last year that was published about uh, people using fentanyl test strips. I don't remember the exact numbers, but um, showing that it did impact people's use. Um, how anecdotally we find that it, it works for people is that they, um, they generally already assume that there's fentanyl in their, uh, in their stamp bag, but uh, doing the fentanyl test strip gives them a little bit more information. Uh, generally, it just means that people are going to make sure that they are not going to use a loan or they uh, will cut their shot, just do a little bit to see how it affects them. And um, with regards to distributing to street level dealers, we don't actually ask anybody who comes to get fentanyl test strips uh, sort of like where they are on the chain. So um, what we do know about drug use and drug users is that there's a lot of people out there who um, you know, sell and distribute drugs in order to maintain their own supply. Um, so we feel like we are getting fentanyl test strips out there to people um, at all the levels, uh, except for maybe, you know, up top, uh, um, who are using drugs. And also, just to, to sort of digress for a second, we're also finding that distributing fentanyl test strips to people who use meth is really important, and we're getting some good feedback on that um, for whatever reason, there's um, fentanyl showing up in, in meth these days, at least here in Allegheny County. I know in 
um, some other parts of the country and uh, obviously that's not the experience somebody's looking for when they're using maps so that's confusing in its own way but also uh, because if they are most accustomed to using meth, they don't have any sort of tolerance for opioids. And so any presence of fentanyl is dangerous for anyone um, if it's in their drug supply, but especially somebody who has absolutely no tolerance for opioids. Mm -hmm. So any other questions, Jess? Um, that's all the questions that have come in so far. Great. <clears throat> well, I um, want to sort of go more into the, the meat of the peer programs that we focus Focus on, and um, so the big a big impetus for us for doing the peer programs uh, is that talking about harm reduction as a social movement. And so there we go. So this um, using peers or employing people who use drugs is a big part of this shift that acknowledges the deep harm of the war on drugs, on the people who use drugs, and that the lives lost through incarceration and overdose are part of a larger system that discredits the worth and the autonomy of people who use drugs. So on that note, this manifesto was written in 2008 by a drug users union in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm going to read a little of it just to help set the tone for talking about peer programs. So from the manifesto, we are among the most vilified and demonized groups in society. Simply because we use illegal drugs, people and governments often deny us our rights and dignity. We are often sent to prison or to compulsory detox and rehab instead of having access to the evidence-based treatment we deserve. We have the right to, be, to meaningfully participate in decision-making on issues affecting us. We have the right to be able to make informed decisions about our health, including what we do or do not put into our bodies. We have unique experiences and experiences and a vital role to play in defining the health, social, legal, and research policies that affect us. <clears throat> we need to be treated as equals and respected for our expertise and professionalism in addressing drug use, HIV, Hep C, overdoses, and other health, social, and human rights issues that affect our lives. We need to be recognized for the work we do, often without funding, in addressing the problems facing people who use drugs. We need to be adequately funded and provided with the resources to represent and address our needs. We need to be supported in fighting the fear, shame, and stigma that keep us from fully participating in our communities and from accessing health services. We need to be meaningfully involved at all levels of the organizations that provide services to us. And I'm including this slide because we all want to see the evidence, right? There is so much evidence out there. I just sort of uh, cherry picked the articles that I liked the most. There's like easily uh, 40 articles written in the last 30 years um, to tell us that people in the harm, what people in the harm reduction movement have already known, that drug users have a worthwhile place in society, and that they can and should be part of the positive change that can occur within healthier use practices. <clears throat> One interesting study to highlight, and again, I've included all these references um, at the end of my presentation, of course. Uh, one study to highlight is the first one um, that they're in New Zealand. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> in New Zealand, the entire country uses a peer approach to needle exchanges. Uh, it's just sort of how they started their harm reduction program in general. And they saw positive outcomes regarding the mental health and safer use for both the peers and the people that they were working with. Um, there was some really interesting info in a lot of the research that, that using peers is really helpful for the people that they're working with, that people use drugs. Um, using peers is also really helpful for the peers. It um, really validates their role that they've already, um, you know, 
been fulfilling in people's lives, and it really, um, you know, helps them see themselves as part of the solution. Uh, when I think that the larger society sees uh, people who use drugs as part of a problem. And so these are the three peer programs of Prevention Point Pittsburgh. Uh, only one of them is, at the moment is currently operational. The, first, the second two should be up and running uh, within the month. And uh, my apologies, when we had planned this webinar months ago, we thought they would all be up and running, but there's uh, IRB, there's grant contracts, there's a lot of bigger moving parts uh, way above my pay grade that sometimes influence uh, our ability to get our programs up and running. So soon they'll both be they'll both be going, but uh, I'm sorry I can't report back any results on them thus far. But I will talk a lot about our community health advocates. So uh, they what they do is they provide the overdose prevention training and the naloxone distribution in neighborhoods that the needle exchange isn't able to get to. Um, and I'll just talk briefly, the Hep C Peer Mentor Group, it's uh, peer educators um, who are focusing on prevention, testing, and treatment for Hep C. Our mobile health advocates work on the mobile testing van, performing Hep C testing and assisting people to get, getting linked to confirmatory testing and further medical care. The community health advocates, so we started this program partially in the response to the fact that we weren't able to get a needle exchange site in the neighborhoods experiencing the highest rate of overdose. If you remember my slide, uh, a few slides back, looking at that heat overdose map and the reddest spot, we didn't have a needle exchange for the longest time. So what we did was we reached out to people who were regular needle exchange participants, people who we already knew picked up lots of Narcan, and had re reported multiple overdose reversals over the years. Uh, the three people that we hired for this were people who are already known in their drug using community as the person to call if someone is experiencing an overdose. And so training them in naloxone distribution and paying them for their work felt like a natural progression. <clears throat> the, um, the community health advocates, they work about six to eight hours a week distributing naloxone and they're paid a monthly stipend. They distribute about 10 kits a month to 10 different people. That's, that's what we hope for for them. Um, recognize that some months are busy than others. Um, anyone who works in substance use knows that there's sometimes uh, seasons for greater use and so, um, or just, you know, we're in Pittsburgh in the winter time. It's hard to get out uh, into the world. So we, we are certainly understanding as folks able to meet their ideal quota each month. But on average, we have folks getting out 10 kits each month. They're done um, in a variety of different ways. Some people just go to the park where they know that people hang out and do drugs and uh, uh, approach them and offer them to walk them that way. Some people prefer to schedule events or to have me help them scheduling events at libraries, shelters, community centers. Uh, and some people just sort of uh, depend on word of mouth and uh, are able to sort of get people to come to them and get that, uh, that naloxone out to them. In the last 18 months, our three CHAs have distributed 525 kits. We're so proud of them. And uh, they've reported 94 refills. So that's people who came back to get another kit because they had used their kit to uh, reverse an overdose. And our community health advocates, they, um, they share other harm reduction materials. For example, they do distribute the, the fentanyl test kits, or fentanyl test strips. Uh, and for a while we had bus tickets, so they were able to give out bus tickets to people to encourage them to get to the needle exchange. We uh, do not encourage them um, or discourage them to distribute sterile injection equipment um, because of all of the legality issues around 
uh, syringes, which are still um, considered paraphernalia in Pennsylvania, uh, even if they're not in Allegheny County, that just puts a multitude of risks for our CHAs. That's not to say that, um, you know, a lot of them, uh, there's three folks, they believe really strongly in harm reduction, they believe in helping people out, they don't want anyone to have to uh, reuse an old syringe. So we do see that they um, pick up other harm reduction equipment for uh, the people that they see, but that's certainly not something that we, um, you know, tell them that they, they should be doing only because of the issues around legality for that. And actually, I just want to, um, I'm going to pause. Oops. Um, previous. Uh, any questions around the legality stuff? I don't, Jess, I just want to check in and see before I went any further if there was any stuff around um, legal issues around syringes for Pennsylvania that I could clear up. No, we have a couple questions, um, but none of them are about that topic. Should I take them now? Um, I don't know. They they kind of address a wide range of questions, so if we can hold them to the end if you want. Um, I Let's hold them to the end. Okay. okay. Great. All right. So I'm going to just keep going. Just wanted to make sure that no one was unclear about uh, how it works to have a needle exchange when they're illegal in the state. It's it's a lot of. Uh, it's certainly not clear <laughs> always. Um, so here's that again that heat overdose map, and then I I. And made these bubbles that I overlaid on top of it to show um, the neighborhoods that our three CHAs uh, reach out to. And then I put the number on top, and that shows for each one of them how how many um, kits of Narcan that they've distributed in the last 18 months. And so um, you can see sort of for the person in the sort of northern section, um, that they, though there's not, you know, it's not as much of a bright red zone, um, they are reaching an area that is quite, quite far away from our needle exchange locations if you're traveling uh, by bus. So uh, they are really, you know, helping to get Narcan out to a population that we're just not able to see a lot of. And for the folks who are further south, they're really like, smack dab on those neighborhoods that are hardest hit by fatal overdose. And so we're just really grateful for all the lives that they've been able to save by reaching out to people that for a variety of reasons aren't able to get to our needle exchange location to get Narcan. Okay, I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about the program that we have right now, Community Health Advocates. I want to talk about the two programs that we are about to be starting um, because they're exciting, they're a little innovative, I think, and uh, yeah, so I'd love to get some feedback around them. So this, uh, the Hep C Peer Mentor Group um, is based completely, I mean, as in like we're copying, uh, the TLC, Test Link Care, project at the Lighthouse Studies at Pierpoint, which is a project at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, really, I saw one of the researchers speak about the program, and I was enamored and asked if they would help us to set up a program just like theirs. And lucky for us, they want to spread the work that they do. And since it is associated with Johns Hopkins, there's already been a lot of research done on the effectiveness of the program. So it's a class that we pay people to attend that teaches them about hep C prevention, testing, and treatment. The class also teaches people how to talk to people about hep C and has lots of great interactive, no pressure practice opportunities. The class runs for four sessions. Participants get a $25 gift card for each class, and there's no... Um, a very low threshold. So, you know, if you miss, a, you miss the second class, you can come back to the third class. We just want people to get as much information uh, as they can around hep C and also just to sort of uh, help dispel some of the, you know, rumors that, that, that are still out there around hep C. And what's really, I thought was really uh, so inspiring about this idea is so much work around 
around peers and using peers is the is hiring someone like like our community health advocates um, hiring somebody seeking somebody out because we consider them to be you know a leader in their community we know that they sort of uh, do a little extra to take care of the, of the health of the people in their community the idea for this peer mentor group is saying anyone can be a natural leader anyone can be doing secondary exchange of information and I use the term secondary exchange because uh, the needle exchange we um, have what we call primary exchange that's when we that's the distributing syringes directly to a person uh, secondary exchange is that person taking some of the syringes that we distributed to them and distributing out to their uh, drug user community so so I, I just this uh, idea of having a peer mentor education group that people are compensated to attend can feels inspiring because we are encouraging more people to become experts and to take charge of their health. And the mobile health advocate. Uh, so these this program we had hoped to have gotten started by the time this webinar had actually happened. And again, just because of contracts, grants, larger moving pieces, we are only now just getting it off the ground. And so we are employing people who are the same sort of natural leaders, uh, caretakers of their drug using community. Uh, but we are employing them to help get folks tested for hepatitis C and linked to treatment. So we have the peers who will be working on our new outreach van which will be parked alongside the needle exchange van in the three different mobile spots. Uh, and then we have the treatment providers, two different clinics who will provide the confirmatory testing for hep C and people can get the hep C care if they're ready. Ready meaning ready for the treatment, not that they have to quit using drugs in order to get the treatment. So that's an important part of this project that we feel especially proud of. And we are grateful for the clinics because they are practicing harm reduction by not denying health care to someone because they use drugs. So these MHAs, as we call them, uh, they're going to work again like six to eight hours a week helping with hepatitis C testing on the mobile van. So uh, they're getting trained and doing the um, or short quick testing. And um, they are going to just be sort of making hep C testing linkage of treatment feel more comfortable and accessible. These and our MHAs uh, will be going through the same um, happy peer mentor education training as we will be doing with the, the weekly group, um, as well as getting you know more training on doing sort of a, a low level case management with people. We're really excited for them to be the comfortable, accessible advocates that can help to lessen any fears or hesitations about getting tested or following up with treatment. So their job duties including uh, learning the hep C testing procedures, testing people for hep C using Orsher test products, learning skills around talking with people about hep C, so ways to prevent contracting hep C, ways to get tested for hep C, ways to get linked to care or treatment for hep C, help with making appointments, and just, you know, in general, checking in with people. All right, so those are our three peer projects. Uh, one that has, you know, been running for 18 months, two that has been running for, uh, you know, minus two weeks. Uh, I wanted to just see and really get feedback on ways that we can improve. This is uh, pulling my um, peers that I have already hired or that will soon be hired. I said, what can we do better? More people, more page training. Drug use union, that's my idea. And uh, yeah. yeah this webinar um, help to eliminate if anyone has ideas of how we can do our work better, how we can do your work better. Like with this
Hey, hey Sarah. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you. Form of civilized society into one where what? Did you need something? Uh, yeah. The, um, the audio is breaking up a little. I wonder if no. you pick up the okay. handset. It might be clearer. Um, it's still breaking up? That sounds better. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm sure the audio is breaking up, so I will definitely go back and talk more about anything. Um, but right now, I just want to leave us just with this quote. If you are trying to transform a brutalized society into one where people can live in dignity and hope, you begin with the empowering of the most powerless. You build from the ground up. All right, and I'll take any questions. All right, um, thank you so much for this presentation of these programs um, and where they're at. Uh, we have a variety of questions, so I'll kind of start chronologically from when they were submitted. And for those of mm -hmm. you who are still in the audience, you can feel free to submit questions via the chat panel. Um, so uh, one of the, the first question is about um, hiring people who use drugs. If you had special concerns related to that around reliability or their safety or anything unique about that that employee group. Uh, no. Um, as a harm reduction organization, we don't actually uh, question anyone's drug use. Uh, whether they are the executive director or a peer. And so uh, I think that in terms of, for just people's safety, again, I mentioned that it's really uh, because of the illegality of syringes, you know, just really wanted to let people know that just because they're distributing naloxone for us, they are under no pressure to, um, to distribute syringes because that puts them at risk of arrest. And so otherwise, uh, we feel that um, our peers are just as reliable as anyone else who works for our organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, we haven't had any issues around, around that. OK, great. Um, and then the next question has to do with the, um, the health promotion program that's been going on for about 18 months. Mm -hmm. And um, the question is, do you think that these particular peers are more effective than non-drug using peers would be, like case managers or people in recovery? Um, and why do you think that? I do think that they are more effective because I think that they are able to get into uh, communities that a lot of people aren't, aren't even aware of. So uh, they were hired for their ability to uh, know people who use drugs and know where people who use drugs hang out. And that's not always something that uh, other case managers or, you know, well-meaning public health officials like myself uh, necessarily know. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, in that way, they provide a special set of expertise. Beyond just sort of being in the know, I think that they... Um, because of their own experience around drug use, have a level of uh, understanding that um, maybe other folks aren't able to bring to the table. And also since they, um, though we certainly, um, to be clear, one of our uh, CHAs, Health Advocates, um, is currently you know, in recovery and others are in, in active use. And uh, as long as they're, you know, somebody who's comfortable being around people who use drugs, we don't require them to be an active drug user, uh, certainly, or to be, you know, in, in recovery uh, of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, we feel like that they uh, can provide a level of comfortability, um, expertise, and um, non-judgment that is sometimes hard for folks who aren't living that same kind of life. Gotcha. OK, great. Thank you. Um, and um, uh, next question is, um, uh, have you thought about using peers with 
specific personal histories to um, help other people address uh, common issues, such as peers that have experience with, con with chronic pain, um, intimate partner violence, or sex work, um, or other issues that are common among people who use drugs? <clears throat> That's a great question. Uh, we have not. Uh, we have generally, let's see, how should I say, we just, we went with peers who we just sort of already knew um, to be people who, had, who were really comfortable doing, using Narcan and uh, being in an overdose situation. Since it's specifically about overdose and naloxone distribution, we are looking for the folks who had, you know, used Narcan a lot, been in a lot of different overdose scenes and could just sort of provide a, a level of expertise around that. And um, the, whatever other background that they may have, um, whether it be around sex work or uh, chronic pain, is just sort of um, more part of just, just who they are and just part of the story that they, that they sort of bring to the table. Uh, and I will just say, actually, to, to, to pause for a second, you know, we, we call our peers community health advocates. Um, we don't ever expect any of our peers to have to stand up and say, you know, uh, at some kind, you know, at any large meeting or something to say, you know, I'm the peer, I'm the person who is the drug user and I'm going to out myself about all this stuff. Um, it's perhaps implied is that with the term community health advocates, but we, uh, we want people to, you know, we want to acknowledge their expertise. We want to, um, we want to compensate for it, and we don't want to exploit it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, another question here is: um, This is a person that's interested in starting an SSP, and they say, great. "What community stakeholders do you recommend connecting with?" first as you start up an SSP, such as law, business, et cetera, um, how do you generate goodwill or at least not scare people? I, well, <laughs> that's something that we have to um, work with a lot here in Pittsburgh. Uh, I would say your best advocates to start might be with um, community clinics, community health clinics. So finding the people who work in healthcare who um, believe in harm reduction, and so um, I think starting starting from there and sort of building your um, your group, and then I would say from from there I would also I would look around what are there are there any are there any syringe service programs in your state that you can reach out to? Are there any in your region that you can reach out to to uh, get support and um, the, you know, there's a, a fervent uh, harm reduction community on the internet or through Harm Reduction Coalition um, that will gladly offer any support that they can. Um, Mason, it's N-A-S-E-N, -S has a starter kit. They will provide mini grants to people starting syringe service programs. Uh, but I would say start with the, start with the folks in healthcare. And then I would maybe try to move on to law enforcement business from there. But it's, uh, you know, sometimes helpful to have people with lots of letters behind their name on your side when you are going to talk to other community members so that they can uh, understand that needle exchange programs um, are a part of healthcare and that they are an evidence-based practice for the last 30 years. Okay, great. Um, next question is just a clarifying question. Um, uh, are the peers who work with clients volunteers? Nope. We, um, we pay them all. Um, they get a monthly stipend. We don't um, keep timesheets on them. Really, we, the peers that we currently employ, um, you know, we know that they're doing the work because they turn in um, paperwork for how many uh, Narcan kits that they've distributed, and that's really the only sort of checking up that we do. And so they're they're paid. The peer mentor group folks will um, just be paid 
for the classes that they attend. So up to $100 for attending four classes, $25 a class. And then our Hep C, uh, the mobile, the mobile health advocates, the ones who will be working on our Hep C outreach van. Um, again, they'll just be, you know, be doing all paid training, and they'll be working hours that we receive a monthly stipend for it. Okay, dokie. And then a related question is, how are these programs funded? Uh, through grants from foundations. Okie dokie. Um, and I think this is the last question I see. Um, um, it's about the Hep C program. Um, okay. What are some big myths about Hep C that your training dispels, and what are some big barriers that you're seeing for people who aren't able to connect to screening and treatment? I think one of the big myths we're seeing is that you you won't get the Hep C cure if you still use drugs. And there's a lot of medical providers who um, who probably are, are saying that in their office. And so finding uh, medical providers who embrace harm reduction and say, no, we want to support people's health and, and no one has to stop using drugs in order to receive that cure. Though so we're definitely, you know, um, if someone wants to stop using drugs, if they want to switch to using suboxone or methadone, uh, especially during the course of treatment and beyond, they um, that's encouraged, but it's certainly not a, a mandatory requirement. So that's a big myth that we see. And I still see uh, a lot of people out there just last week talking with an older woman with hep C, and she said, I just, you know, the cure, it's too painful. And she was referring to the interferon, like the the old cure for Hep C, which was was really intense and took um, you know months of time and really required having uh, a lot of support and stable housing and um, a lot of things that that would just make it too hard for a lot of people to successfully uh, complete that treatment. The new Hep C treatment um, is a lot more manageable and it's you know just taking a pill for uh, six weeks and so people can handle that a lot easier. And so I think really trying to help people understand um, some of those myths. In terms of barriers to getting Hep C treatment, I think that it's, um, yeah, people just don't know what's out there. They don't even know where to start. A lot of people just assume they have Hep C when they don't. You know, like I've been using drugs for this long, I'm sure I've got Hep C. Um, and they don't, and so really trying to to help sort of figure out who has it, who doesn't have it, and for who has it, helping them understand that treatment is not unattainable. It is completely possible for them to get cured of Hep C and uh, just have such a uh, such greater health outcomes for the rest of their lives um, because they won't have a chronic liver disease. And so uh, I think that what we're looking at when we talk about the opioid crisis is that this isn't that you know we're trying to uh, address the number of fatal overdoses for sure. We're also trying to address the chronic health conditions that come from drug use and hepatitis C uh, is is affecting the folks who use drugs, the folks who inject drugs at an alarming rate. Mm -hmm. All right, we have actually one more question, and it's um, it's about the TLC program that your mm -hmm. program is modeled on. Um, how long has it been going on? Has it is it still going on? Um, and do you know more about their outcomes? I I do know more about their outcomes. Let me find. Um, the, so the program's been going on for I think. Um, about 10 years. They've been doing it for a long time. And what they have found, let me look for it really quick. Actually, I can just click back a few slides. Hold on while I click. So this last, people who engaged in a risk reduction education group, this uh, last bullet point, we're three times more likely to report reduction of ingestion risk behaviors and four times more likely to report 
increased condom use. So this um, that is from the same uh, Hep C um, education group. They also we do some uh, talking about condoms and just risk reduction. But they're finding that uh, yes, that that people who are engaged in the TLC project are more likely to um, get tested for Hep C and get linked to treatment for Hep C than people who don't engage in it. And if you look under, um, if you look in the references at the end, there should be some articles specifically about the Hep C peer mentor project. Okay, any um, other questions? No, I think that covers it. Um, did you have any anything to add, or should we wrap things up? No, uh, I just um, I hope to you know report back to folks in six months to a year with all of the great data that we have about um, how our Hep C peer projects have progressed. So thanks everyone for taking the time out of your busy day to uh, listen and learn about peer programs. Um, well, thank you, Sarah, so much for sharing, um, and uh, thanks, everyone, for your great questions. And right now, I'm going to just run through the, um, the process for CEUs. Um, so uh, this webinar is approved for, let me see if I can share my screen with you all. Um, this webinar is approved for one free um, uh, PCB and one free NADAC continuing education credit. Um, you'll re receive a couple emails from us following this webinar. In these emails will be a link to a recording of the webinar as well as a PDF version of Sarah's slides so you can look at the references. Um, also included in the email is going to be a link to the evaluation. Um, and we would just appreciate so much if you participated um, by filling out the evaluation. It shouldn't take any more than two minutes of your time, and it helps us to make your, uh, these presentations better and more relevant to you. Um, once you fill out the evaluation, uh, you'll see a form for requesting a certificate of attendance or for any CEUs. Uh, if you choose to skip the evaluation, you can proceed directly to the CEU request. Um, just leave all of the answers blank on the evaluation. Um, so that is the end of the housekeeping, and again, I just want to thank everybody, Sarah and all of the participants. Thank you so much for joining this webinar today, and if you have any questions, please send us an email at info at All right. Thanks, everyone.